Hey, thanks for joining us today uh, here at North Point as we get together to get woke, to, to begin to see Jesus working in ways that we didn't anticipate. We're in this series that that's what we're talking about. That's what we're looking at. And we're so glad that you're here. Uh, before we get there, let me, let me just encourage you. We would love to know that you're with us today. If you've got the North Point app, if you'd open that up, and if you'd send a message, that if you'd open the Let's Connect tab and just fill that out for us and let us know that you're here in the online service, that would be outstanding. And if you don't have the North Point app, if you could send a text to 94090, again, that's text 94090 with the message guest NCC. We'll send you a link out. You can fill out that same form. Let us know that you're here in the online service and that would be great. A couple of things going on that I want to be sure and let you know about today. One, we we start today a, a project that we're just calling Giving Tables. We've partnered with Redeemer Church, Redeemer Methodist Church here in DeWitt. They have an incredible food pantry that helps people who are hurting financially, who may not have the resources to be able to provide food for their family. They do an incredible job in that. But their food pantry... Uh, provides food. It doesn't provide like household goods, those kinds of things. And so uh, for the next several weeks, we're going to be collecting those at North Point. You can drop them by, by during the week. You can drop them off on a Sunday if you want to do that. Things like laundry soap and dish soap and uh, hand soap, all of those kinds of things. Cleaners that might be really, really helpful for a family that doesn't have many resources right now. Um, we're gonna, we'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks till the middle of November and then taking those over to Redeemer and they'll be available to to people who, who come to the food pantry and, uh, and need help. That would be great. Another thing that you can do to help make a difference here in our community is today we're doing a benevolence offering. We do that about four times a year, and that offering goes completely to help meet the needs of people who are in financial trouble here in our area. They may be from North Point. They may not be from North Point. Here's how you do it. Just uh, you, can, you could mail a gift to the church, so send it to the church office. That would be great. Or you can give electronically by uh, sending a text to 77977, 77977, um, uh, that, that says NCC Give in the message, NCC Give. Um, once you open that up, we'll send a link, you can open that up. Once you open it up, there is, um, there's a, a place where you can put general offering or benevolence offering. Click on benevolence offering and that will go to the benevolence offering. While you're there, if you want to do that, go through that process again and give back to God through North Point, uh, just a part of your regular offering, your regular gifts, your regular tithes, we would love to have you do that. That would uh, make a difference both here in our area and around the world in an incredible way. It's a way that we can just say, God, we trust you for everything. Even in the midst of the pandemic, we trust you to provide for us um, every day for all of our needs. Hey. Uh, we're going to jump into the message in just a second, have a chance to worship a little bit after that. We're so glad you're here. Uh, stick with us as we look at finding Jesus in the midst of an angry mob. Um, these are crazy times, right? You know, uh, who would have ever thought that... Uh, we would be announcing our new president on a Saturday afternoon. That just seems funny, right? That's when football is supposed to be played, right? We won't go there either. Um, uh, diff difficult times on two fronts there yesterday, right? Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we're in this series that, that we've been talking about what it looks like to find Jesus in all kinds of environments. And particularly, we've been talking about finding Jesus when it when it seems like it's kind of foggy, like we don't know if he's there or not. We talked about finding Jesus um, in just mundane, in the routine, regular stuff that's going on. We've talked about finding Jesus when you're celebrating, finding Jesus um, in the middle of storms, finding Jesus in the silence. Last week, we talked about finding Jesus in the election, and um, and now it really is kind of like, okay, uh, what what are we doing today? Today, finding Jesus in an angry mob. Um, that seems a little appropriate, right? Because there's still a whole lot of stuff going on. The last six months, there have been all kinds of uh, times 
where people have just been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. How do we find Jesus in the midst of that? Is Jesus even working? Can, can we locate him in that? Today, we're, we're, uh, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that describes this huge mob that just goes crazy and ultimately, well, I won't tell you the end of the story. We'll get there soon. But, uh, but it, it's crazy, and yet Jesus is working in the middle of that. And so if you've got your Bibles, uh, go ahead and take those out. Turn to Acts chapter 6. We're going we're gonna to discover the life of a, this guy named Stephen. And we're going to read a ton of scripture today. If you've got a Bible, uh, you, can, you can read later. Uh, the text is going to be on screen. If you, um, if you want to use the North Point app and haven't downloaded it yet, you can actually uh, send a text to 94090. 94090. Um, and with the message app NCC, and that will allow you to download the app and uh, the notes as well. Um, how do, we, how do we discover, how do we get woke, how, how do we become aware of finding Jesus in an angry mob? Let's jump into Acts chapter 6. Um, well, let me just say one last thing first. Why is that important? We, we've been talking about North Point, about uh, what's, what's our mission as a church? It's to help all people move towards a life fully devoted to Jesus. If you've been around, you've heard that. Uh, a time or two, right? Helping all people move towards a life fully devoted to Jesus. All people means people who voted for President Trump. It means people who voted for President Biden. It means Bi President-elect Biden. Uh, it means people who didn't vote, right? People from other countries and cultures. Helping all people move towards a life fully devoted to Jesus. That's our mission. Our vision is that everybody who is a part of North Point would regularly be talking about how Jesus is working in their life and that they would recognize that Jesus is working in their life regardless of the cir circumstances. That's why we're in this series. That's why we're going to Acts chapter 6. Let's get there now, all right? In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. A couple of things just in that verse let me just explain. There were, there were Jews who were born in Palestine who spoke Hebrew. That was their native language. There were Jews who weren't born in Palestine who were from another part of the world um, that spoke Greek as their native language. And, um, and they were there too. They're all become followers of Jesus. They're all together there. And this division arises because the, the Jewish widows, the church took care of the widows that uh, their husbands had died. So they're meeting their knees. The, the widows who were from Palestine that spoke Jewish were getting favorable treatment. Um, it's both encouraging and discouraging, I think, that in the first century church, within, um, within probably a decade of when Jesus ascended, they're fighting in the church. That's discouraging, right? But it's encouraging because it means that they were real people just like us. Right, and, and so the church said, what do we do about this division? So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us, the 12 apostles, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the apostles are going to take care of the spiritual stuff. They need somebody to take care of these widows. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, and then five others, seven deacons that they chose. That, this is the first time that we meet Stephen. Verse 8, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. He could do miracles. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they couldn't stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this guy never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. 
For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So we've met this guy named Stephen, who's a regular guy, but he's full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and he's able to perform great signs and wonders. God uses him and does miracles through what uh, Stephen, uh, through, through Stephen. The Jewish leaders didn't like it. There's, uh, there are two things in there that if you're studying, you're thinking, wait, what's that? The synagogue of the freedmen was a synagogue that, was, that was, uh, had been set up especially for Jews who had been slaves in Rome but had been freed. Okay, synagogue of the freedmen, that makes sense. Um, the reason that, the, that they were freed from slavery, interestingly enough, was because they were so committed to God, so committed to the Jewish faith, that they had to obey the Sabbath and they wouldn't work on Saturdays. So if you've got a slave and you're having a party on Saturday and they won't work, what do you do? They freed them. They just freed them from slavery. So there's this synagogue of the freedmen. It's very possible that Saul, who later becomes Paul when he becomes a follower of Jesus, who goes by the, the Greek name that's there, um, that Saul was a part of this synagogue of the freedmen. We learn later in Scripture that Saul was a Roman citizen by birth. His parents had probably been freed from slavery or his grandparents. So um, that's the synagogue of the freedmen. Stephen, Stephen gets into discussion with these guys, and he's so wise that he's able to articulate a, a path that these guys can't keep up with intellectually, they can't follow him. So you know, um, if, if you're geared towards logic and intellect, this message that Stephen gives today in his defense is one that's uh, filled with incredible logic in, in terms of taking the people that he's on trial with and taking them to a natural conclusion. So Stephen, uh, Stephen debates with these guys, the synagogue of the freedmen. Ultimately, they don't like it. They bring charges against him. They say, oh, he blasphemes against God, against Moses, against the law, and against the temple. And so we've got to put him on trial. Blasphemy was a big deal, a big deal. And so they put him on trial in, 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 in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group of Jewish leaders that were really kind of like the Supreme Court for the Jews. They, they covered um, any, any kind of conflict that couldn't be resolved at a lower level, whether that was a spiritual uh, issue or whether that was a physical issue. The Sanhedrin were like, they were all that and a bag of chips, okay? They were, they were the top of the top for the Jewish people, even in a, a different culture. So Stephen's going on trial with them, um, and it says that, that he's ready to go on trial, and it says that he has the face of an angel. Don't you wonder what that was like? what that looked like. Did it, did, does that mean that he was handsome? Um, probably, probably not. Does it mean that he, like he had a halo above him, like in art, you know, from, from the, the dark ages, that kind of thing? Probably not. Does it mean that he had a shaped head and a goatee? Probably so, um, you know. Uh, does it mean that he had a glow like Moses when Moses went on Mount Sinai and came back? I, I don't know. We, it just said that it's just described that he had a face like an angel. Have you ever been around somebody that whenever you talk to them, whenever you walked in a room, it was like, man, they know God. They have this relationship with Jesus. They just look different. They have this sense of peace, the sense of assurance, the sense of joy. That just carries them through every. I think that's probably what it was. Stephen's there, ready to go on trial. And he looks like an angel. Pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, one, one last thing before we jump into what Stephen says. Don't miss this. Stephen was just a regular guy, right? Stephen was not one of the 12 apostles. He was just a regular guy. We don't ever hear of Stephen until the beginning of Acts chapter 6. And in Acts chapter 6, he's set aside, he's full of the Holy Spirit, but he's set aside to do the Meals on Wheels program for the widows, right? He, he's, all he's doing is serving, making sure that everybody is being treated fairly. He's just a regular guy, but he's full of God's presence and God's spirit. Um, 
He understood in that moment what was at stake. And he didn't have to go running home to prepare his defense. He knew who he was. He knew what he valued. He knew what was most important to him. So he was ready in a moment's notice. You know, he didn't pull out his phone and call his pastor and say, what do I say? He was ready because he knew who he was. He was confident of his faith. He's, Stephen is put on trial because he's wise, because his logic is irrefutable, because, because the Jewish leaders can't keep up with him intellectually, so they lie about his character. They lie about what he said. They misrepresent the truth. Um, I, I wondered if maybe this message, you know, finding Jesus in an angry mob, maybe if it would have been better to title this, Finding Jesus When Your Character is Defamed. Because we often find ourselves where people are yipping and yapping and saying stuff about us that may not be true, right? How do you find Jesus in that kind of situation? Acts chapter 7, verse 1. The high priest asks Stephen, are these charges true? Blasphemy against God, blasphemy against Moses, blasphemy against uh, the temple, blasphemy against the law of Moses. Are, are these charges true? He's essentially saying, are you guilty or are you not guilty? What, what are you going to plead? Stephen sees an opportunity. He could say yes, he could say no. But he just starts to talk. Interestingly enough, Stephen's response to this question is the longest uh, time anybody talks, the longest set of dialogue, the, uh, of, uh, a message in the book of Acts. It's, almost, it's not as long as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, but it's, it's a significant explanation of where Stephen is coming from. I want to encourage you to go home and read the whole thing because we're, we're just going to kind of bust through it today. It, it, Stephen begins to defend himself against those four charges. In a, in a debate, what happens, not a presidential debate because they kind of spiral out of control, right? Um, but in an actual debate, what happens is there's an issue. One side makes a case. The other side then rebuts the arguments of that case and, and then says, oh, no, that's not true. This is why. Then the other side rebuts their arguments, and, and the person that wins the debate is ultimately the person who has made the most points that have not been refuted. Does that make sense? This is not a debate that Stephen's in, but Stephen says, okay, here are the four charges. Let me talk about those four charges. And, um, and that then, that's then how, how he begins to respond. Stephen's reasonable. He's thoughtful. He's wise, all right? Uh, the first charge is a charge of blasphemy against God. Um, are these charges true? Verse 2, to this he replied, brothers and, and fathers, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land that I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans, Abraham did, and settled in Haran. Stephen says, hey, brothers, fathers, this is the story of our people. He aligns himself with, with the Sanhedrin that are there. He's saying, you know what, you're, you're saying that, that, um, that I have uh, blasphemed against God. It's, that's not true. We share the same God. I worship the same God. He, then he describes him as the God of glory appeared to Abraham, which is a really interesting phrase because it's only used two times in Scripture. It's used by Stephen, and it's used in, in uh, Psalm 29, an incredibly beautiful psalm that, that you may know. Psalm 29, verses 1 through 3 say, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. Stephen says, we serve the same God. We, we think, oh, that's kind of uh, maybe a little obscure. Stephen was saying, I know scripture. The God I serve is the exact same God that you serve. I'm not blaspheming God. So then he moves on to blasphemy against, the, uh, against Moses. Um, Stephen talks through Abraham and Joseph, ultimately to Moses in verse 20. At that time Moses was born, he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his family. When he was pl placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Stephen says, Moses was our ancestor. I'm with you. 
I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about Moses. Moses is the guy that God used to lead us out of slavery. He moves from there to talk about the blasphemy against the law of Moses. Verse 39, our ancestors refused to obey Moses. They rejected him. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This is agree what was written in the book of the prophets. And, and Stephen begins to quote the law, the prophets. Stephen says, I agree with the law. I agree with the law. I'm not blaspheming. Verse 44, our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. That, those were our ancestors. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and, f and asked what he might provide, that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. See what, what Stephen has done? He's transitioned from the charge against blas about blasphemy against the law into directly into the charge about blasphemy against the temple. Verse 48, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven's my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? Stephen says, hey, look, I'm not blaspheming the temple, but, but understand, you guys don't have it right. God, yeah, God lives in the Holy of Holies in the temple, but God made it all. There's not anything that contained him. I'm not blaspheming the temple. Stephen then moves to, to start boldly his conclusion. When he goes into the conclusion, um, he begins to connect the dots. Stephen has said, hey, look, Abraham was our father. And Abraham followed God where God led. Ultimately, Abraham's grandson that, uh, had, had all these sons. Uh, you know, Jacob had all these sons. Joseph was one of us, one of them. God chose Joseph to save the nation because he knew a famine was coming. But what happened? All of Joseph's brothers, they tried to kill him. This guy that God provided to save the nation, was, they tried to kill. Then he goes down and goes into Moses, and he, and he says, God raised up Moses to lead us from slavery, and you rejected him. Then he goes into his conclusion in verse 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uh, uncircumcised. Understand that circumcision, the, the cutting of flesh, that was, a, that was the symbol of the promise that God made that the Jews would be his people. And so to call the Jewish leaders uncircumcised was like to, to put a knife in their heart and, and, to, and to just say, you've missed it completely. Pause just for a second. Uh, all the years that I've been reading Acts chapter 7, I've always had in my mind this picture of Stephen starts and he tells the story of history and he just gets bolder and bolder and bolder and until he finally says, you stiff-necked people. In studying this passage this week, I think, that's, I think it's completely wrong because I read it that way always because the exclamation points that are there as it's translated into English. Understand that when it was written, there were no exclamation points. Right? No punctuation in the Greek language. I, I actually think Stephen, because he's described as being full of the Holy Spirit, of the wisdom of God, I, I think Stephen probably at this time is very mild mannered and controlled. He says, This is the story of our people. You've always rejected God. You stiff necked people, don't you understand? You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet that your ancestors didn't persecute? They even, they even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah. And now 
now you've betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through the angels, but haven't obeyed it. And now is when the mob goes crazy. Verse 54, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. I, I don't know what's in your mind when you think about somebody being stoned. Uh, you know, I, th I think about people grabbing like baseball-sized rocks or whatever. What probably happened is that they rushed Stephen out of the area where they were meeting, out through the city gate and out to a cliff and pushed him over the cliff where he would land in a pile of rocks, smash his head, um, probably die. If a person didn't die when they were stoned that way, they would then take rocks off the cliff and throw them down on him 15, 20, 25 feet below. It, it wasn't, oh, let's just cover the guy. It was, it was that they were going to use stones to break his head and destroy his brain and kill him. Stephen says, I see God. God, don't hold this against them. Do you, do you see the picture of what Stephen was like? Was, was Jesus working when Stephen was killed? Absolutely. Was God powerless in the face of the Sanhedrin? Absolutely not. God had a bigger plan. The end was really the beginning, right? The end of Stephen's life was the beginning of the next chapter because what happens is that it says in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, Saul approved of their killing Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles who were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The rest of the story, the next chapter, was that the church would grow. It would spread throughout Asia Minor. All of a sudden, the good news of the gospel would go everywhere because Stephen died because he was killed. The end was really the beginning. Um, Saul was there. Saul was there. This is such an important part of the, of the whole story that's just so interesting to me. Saul had probably debated with Stephens, and Saul was one smart cookie. You know, when, when you read through the New Testament, all that Saul wrote, he wrote almost a third of the New Testament. Saul's logic is, is irrefutable. But Saul, if he was a part of the debates with Stephen, couldn't stand up to Stephen. Saul's there when Stephen's killed. Saul sees Stephen say, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. Saul hears Stephen say, God forgive him. Don't hold it against him. Later, when Saul is traveling to persecute Christians, on, he's on the, on the road to Damascus, and supernaturally God appears to him, blinds him, and says, Saul, why are you doing this? Why are you kicking against me? I'm Jesus, the one who came to redeem you, the righteous one. Why are you doing that, Saul? Saul comes to a place where he is broken because he recognizes that the God that he loves and serves, he had missed it completely, that it wasn't about the Jewish law, it was about the promised Messiah and that they had killed Jesus. Acts uh, chapter 9, I think, tells us that, um, that Saul, after that encounter, goes to Damascus, and for three days he doesn't eat or drink. Um, I, I believe, I believe with my whole heart that he was so overwhelmed with grief that he had missed it so badly that he, just, he couldn't. Food was like, oh, can't eat, drink. He was so broken, so repentant at that point in time. And I've got to believe that a part of that conviction that he had was because he saw Stephen die. 
because he participated in that. The end was the beginning. If, if you want to see Jesus working, if you want to find Jesus working in an angry mob, what do you need to do? Let me give you just a, a few things. The first is this. Do your homework now. Stephen, I've already said, he was just a regular guy. But he had cultivated his relationship with Jesus so much so that he was ready to defend uh, who he was, why he was there. He was ready in a moment's notice because he had his relationship was secure. He knew what he believed. He knew why he believed it. His faithfulness was exhibited with the other deacons as they took care of, of the widows. He had, he had done what he needed to do in the everyday to be ready for the crisis that was going to come. Understand that monumental moments are formed in the mundane. If it feels like your life in, in all that exciting, you're just kind of going through the process, raising your kids, going to work, doing all that stuff. That is when your character is formed in preparation for the crisis that will come in the future. Do your homework now. There's a story that's told about an old rabbi who a person came to and said, um, Rabbi, um, when should we repent? And the old rabbi looked wisely and said, you should repent on the day before you die. And the person said, but I don't know when I'm going to die. And the rabbi said, exactly. You need to repent today. You need to get right today. You need to do the things now to develop, develop that relationship with Jesus. When the mob comes, you need to be prepared to defend what you believe and why. You need to be prepared to defend what you believe and why. 1 Peter 3 says, in your hearts, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe that Jesus is the only way? Why do you believe that Jesus can give hope? Why do you believe that there's life after death? Always be prepared to be able to just tell your story. It's not you have to have this, this big rational process that uh, you're ready to go with at, in a, at, a given, at a given moment, but that you just know what you believe and why. Um, because Stephen knew Scripture, he knew who Jesus was. Uh, let, me, let me just tease where we're going to go in January. Um, a couple of years ago, we did, we did a challenge where we, were gonna, where we read all the way through the Bible in 90 days. Um, we're going to do a variation of that this coming January. We're going to read all the way through the New Testament in 90 days, and I want to encourage you to start thinking about uh, being able to do that. That's going to be a cool thing. Why is that? Because when we know Scripture, we understand who Jesus is and how he impacts our lives. How, how, do you, how do you find Jesus in the mob? How do you get ready for it? You look for the opportunity in crisis. Um, Stephen could have said, when, when, when the Sanhedrin says, are these charges true? Stephen could have said, yep, they're true, and left it at that. He could have said, nope, they're not true, and left it at that. Stephen saw an opportunity to speak to the Jewish leaders and to help them come face to face with Jesus. Look for an opportunity in the crisis. In my notes, I said, do you want to be an ant or a roly-poly? You know what the roly-polies are? You touch them and they curl up in a ball. Uh, you know, they protect themselves. With ants, you touch an ant, they just keep going, right? Try and stamp on an anthill and they just keep coming more and more and more. They keep, they keep on task. You've got to be ready. Look for an opportunity in the crisis. Um, Stephen used the accusations that were arose to help other people see Jesus. Acts 8.1, Saul approved of their killing them. On that day, the persecution grew. Um, what, what else, how else do you find Jesus in the midst of a mob? Forgive when you're treated unjustly, when you're accused falsely. Um, 
forgiveness in a time of crisis allows Jesus to shine through us in a way that is like nothing else. Can you imagine being stoned? Can you imagine being thrown down that cliff, rocks coming down on your head and saying, God, don't hold that against them. God, don't hold that against them. Forgiveness allows Jesus to work in us, no matter what's going on. Um, let, me, let me just finish with this. Understand that when we talk about finding Jesus in an angry mob, for many of us, who, we think, uh, I'm just going to avoid the angry mob, right? Um, when, the, when the crisis breaks out, when the riot happens, I'm not going there. Hear what Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, Saul persecutions, my sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you understand that if we're serious about following Jesus, we are going to find ourselves in an angry mob? Because following Jesus is counterculture to the world that we live in. We've got to be ready to look for Jesus. We've got to be doing our homework. We've got to forgive. We've got to do all those things. Verse 14 in that passage says, As for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of. The holy scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures, God breathed, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you want to find Jesus in the midst of persecution? In the midst of the angry mob, man, the place to start is to dive into God's word and to let him speak to you there. Let's pray. Father, we, we, we thank you for the example of Stephen. Lord, I, I thank you that uh, um, he's not some distant character. But he's a real guy. That, um, Lord, someday we hope to talk to in heaven if that's a part of the way heaven works. God, I thank you for his faithfulness, for his example, for the things that we learn from his story. God, I thank you that we don't need to be afraid of crisis or persecution or angry mobs because we know that you're there. You're, we know that you're there in the midst of it. Help us, Lord. Be faithful at every turn. God, give us hope. Give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Do what only you can do. With one word, the mountains move. When you breathe, the dead arise, and the bones come back to life. There is power in this room, where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's life, where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom, like a river running wild, like a never-ending fire. Where the Spirit of the Lord is and It's your name that tears down walls And every enemy will fall So we will stand and we will fight Every wrong will be made right Spirit of the Lord is there's life where the Spirit of the Lord is there's freedom like a river running wild like a never ending fire 
where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's life where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom like a river running wild, like a never ending fire where the Spirit of the Lord Shouting to the nations, your love has set us free. You're moving through our cities, your spirit fills our streets. We're shouting to the nations, your love has set us free. Yeah, you're moving through our cities, your spirit fills our streets. Shouting to the nations, your love has set us free. Spirit of the Lord is There's life Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Like a river running wild Like a never ending fire Where the Spirit of the Lord is There's life Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom like a river running wild, like a never ending fire, where the Spirit of the Lord is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.